a video on North American honeybee colony collapse. Incorporating hive designs with supporting procedures intended to reduce instances of honeybee colony collapse, plus a method and process to revitalize the North American beekeeping industry. Above, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a proposed type of label or graphic implying endorsement of products derived from plants pollinated by approved North American beekeepers, as defined in the attached business plan. See the last slide. A label with such graphics would be applied to actual crop products or printed on containers whose contents were manufactured using such crop products. Disclosure. Hive components depicted in this presentation only exist as computer-generated 3D models, not as physical, tangible parts. Honeybee Colony Collapse During my research into the current state of the North American beekeeping industry, I was perplexed by the constant drumbeat of colony collapse and what should be done to correct it. My perspective is that solutions are available, but just not totally implemented, nor using an integrated approach. The North American beekeeping industry seems to be challenged by shrinking profits while concurrently battling many causes of colony collapse. Recently, I saw a publication that Walmart, yes, the retailer, filed for a US patent application for a robotic pollination bee device, stating something such as, the device was needed because of the continued and unpredictable shortage of actual real honeybees for certain crop pollination as a result of colony collapse and how it could severely impact Walmart's future food supply chain. Wow. I have no idea if their pollination device would work, be practical, economical, or even safe to use. However, shouldn't this be a wake-up call for the American beekeeping industry? To me, colony collapse has a lot to do with hive designs and their supporting practices. So I set out to generate hive designs which might be capable of reducing the North American beekeeping industry's instances of colony collapse from a two-digit percentage to a mid-single-digit percentage. Further, to demonstrate my personal commitment to assist in the unacceptable occurrences of colony collapse, I'm offering my conceptual design graphics one and a half years in development in an open design format, meaning non-trademark graphics depicted in this presentation are available to the general public at no cost. My intent in providing said design concepts and procedures is to possibly fast track the revitalization of the North American beekeeping industry. The current industry practices of constantly demanding lower hive components costs by itself or stating new techn technical approaches are not practical for commercial beekeepers and should be directed to backyard beekeeping hobbyists will probably not provide the profitability to create a turnaround to ensure a robust industry. I recognize it is relatively easy to suggest changes, generating conceptual hive designs and supporting procedures, which may assist in the North American beekeeping industry's goal of reducing occurrences of colony collapse compared to actually implementing them. 
To possibly address the latter, I have provided on the last slide suggested steps or actions which may facilitate the revitalization of the industry, all with little or no cost to North American beekeepers. Hi, I'm Mike Farrell. I will be showing you hive designs with supporting concepts referred to as insel hive. Their focus, lowering total cost of beekeeping through innovative hive designs and improved practices versus pursuing diminishing returns on hive component cost reductions. Insel hive using a different costing approach for hive components. Before addressing significant beekeeping hive issues, allow me to explain a costing concept I will refer to during this presentation, reducing your total cost of beekeeping. On the left side of the slide, you'll see an eight by one half hex washer head type A sheet metal screw. It was introduced in the 1930s. Its cost in the 1960s was $2.45 per 1,000 pieces and lot sizes of 50,000 pieces. On the right, you see the same screw, but it has a soft drilling point. It was introduced in the 60s and its cost was $19.85 cents per 1,000 pieces in the same 50,000 pieces lot size. It was 810% more than the Type A screw. These two different screws were designed to perform the same fastening application. Why would companies buy a same application product when it would cost eight times more? Well, they did, so much so the factory, Illinois Tool Work Shake Proof, had to quote lead times of 20 weeks until they could ramp production. Why did companies pay this higher price? Because of other contributing cost factors. One, labor reduction. Two, lower incident of damaged products surfaces three, faster job completion times, four, reduced need to purchase items such as twist drills, clamps, etc. Five, ability to maintain assembly line rates and many more. I think you get the point. Today, this same soft drilling screw costs $4.25 per the same lot size of 50,000 pieces. The Texas Instrument Theory states, for emerging technology, doubling production volume usually results in a reduction of cost by 50%. This will probably be true for Inselhive. Now, let's examine how this costing approach might improve your company's profitability. Potential annualized reduction in total beekeeping costs. Now take the concepts of the previous slide and think how they could be relevant to the beekeeping operating cost factors, which are defined below. Note in the spreadsheet, there was no reference to potential savings from hive components unit reductions. Why? because the latter has been worked to death over years and today represents relatively small diminishing return opportunities. Think about the last slide. The type A sheet metal screw had, had so much unit cost reduction pressure. The only thing manufacturers could do was to lower the quality of the part now by using the dies way past their design life and by lowering standards for hidden costs such as wire quality, plating, coating thickness, subpar heat treating, etc. Now 
think about today's unit cost reduction practices for hive components demanding that hive boxes cost $11 or less plastic honeycomb frame manufacturers pressured to constantly lower unit cost every year by several cents sound familiar could a possible outcome of beekeepers constantly focusing on high component cost reductions result in what happened to the common sheet metal screw? You be the judge. More importantly, do you think the unit cost reduction approach currently used will ever provide the potential savings of reducing total cost of doing beekeeping? Again, you be the judge. For your future reference, let's take an orientation tour of the Insel Hive designs. You're presently looking at an isometric view. Notice the base with skids and removable entrance. The base is an improved bottom board. It has a standard queen excluder, but a new optional drinking and feeding system a roof cover, a standard brew box, and a deep super. In the front view, you can see there would be an automated front entrance door closure system for nights and cold weather conditions. The entrance door would be insulated Barcode decals would be heat transferred into component outer housings, resulting in them being physically bonded into the component's outer wall. They could only be removed by destroying the component. Manually adjustable vents would be incorporated into each super. In the optional drinking and feeding module, removable inspection ports would be provided. Also, this component would have a means to control and contain potential spills. A unique self-adjusting ventilation and temperature control unit would exist in the roof. B escapes would exist in brood boxes and supers. In the back view, you will see a removable drawer containing an insect debris trap. Above this insect debris trap would be a perforated floor grid, which would be also removable. Each housing component would have mating metal plates riveted to the upper and lower edges of sides and backs. They would be provided to allow separation of housing components using a hive tool without damaging the housing. Further, they would accommodate rotary latches for extreme holding requirements. In the roof would be a passive dehumidifier with a cover to be inserted when cold conditions did not exist. A proprietary joint design would exist between mating housing components. Incorporated in the skids would be a crawling insect repellent system. The left side shows the elongated skids replacing feet. This is to allow them to span across gaps between pallet slats. The front entrance or landing zone would be covered with a removable insulated cover. Within the drinking and feeding housing, there would be a passive spill drainage device. Hand grips would be provided in each housing. Again, plastic surfaces, which would come in contact with metal hive tools and or forks on lifts, would be protected with metal guards. Across the side of the base would be a pallet tie-down strip. The right side view shows an optional removable beetle guard 
Both the front entrance cover and the roof's top's outer surfaces would have contours to afford fast and effective runoff of rain and snow. Further, these shapes would be designed to deflect harmful UV rays. Again, housing components would have outer walls shaped as vertical corrugations to provide for high compression values to resist outward side ballooning. The roof would have stacking bosses to allow them to be shipped or stored in a standalone configuration. The bottom view shows numerous ventilation inlets. On the inside surfaces of these inlets would be a screen. Having a mesh size smaller than most intrusive insects. Ports would allow drainage of water collected from the top surfaces of the front entrance. Note the rigid plastic sponges which would be pressed into the channel around each skid. They would be provided to absorb low diffusion insect repellent chemicals. The internal housing for the lifting and closing system for the front entrance door would be sealed. Finally, we end the orientation tour in the top view. Again, note all outer walls of all enclosure housing components are configured with vertical columns. As previously mentioned in side views, the top surfaces of the roof and entrance cover would have unique outer contours to specifically provide for sun, UV, deflection, and rained and or snow runoff. Stacking bosses on the roof would be designed to allow water drainage to eliminate possible damage from freezing expansion. The mating joint between the brood box and the front entrance cover would be sealed with a rubber gasket, the latter attached to the front entrance assembly. The displayed colors of the components described in this presentation are for demonstration purposes only. In real field applications, all outer housing components would be fabricated with resins blended with white or silver pigments. If you refer to attachment A, you will see a listing of what Langstroth defined circa 1862 as requirements for an effective hive. Okay, now let's see how these designs may improve the profitability of your beekeeping business. Hive and Related Components Designs Intended to lower total beekeeping costs by Controlling temperature, ventilation, and humidity Enabling effective integrated pest management with less effort Providing industry-compatible, long-lasting integrated components Promoting robust bee colonies earlier in the spring. Reducing field servicing efforts, site relocation time, and seasonal storage cost. Affording data collection, resource management with theft deterrence and recovery, plus airborne pesticide monitoring. Note, a single feature may provide multiple benefits. Also, one or more features may combine to create a single benefit. Temperature control through insulated housings, gap-free joints, self-adjusting louvered exhaust vent, entrance door temperature controller, removable insulated front entrance cover, Insulated housings. The insulation foam to be used in insulated 
would be a similar type used in water coolers, except insole hive would have a thicker wall, approximately 30%. The insulation and ceiling joints should provide an inside temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit, while the outside temperature may range from 120 degrees Fahrenheit to a minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit. 45 degree tongue and groove gap free joint. The mating joints of the hive components would use a 45 degree tongue groove gap free joint design. It would be effective in maintaining targeted internal temperatures and restricting entrance of unwanted pests. It would provide easy separation of components without destroying them over time. Note, the single feature gap-free joint supports multiple effects. Temperature control, insect pest barrier, nesting stability against high wind conditions, and load integrity during shipments. Temperature control. When unattended for both seasonal and day slash night requirements, it is essential that both temperature and ventilation control of the hive be self-adjusting. To accomplish this, a self-adjusting temperature slash ventilation controller mounted in the roof component of the hive would be provided. Further, a manual override adjusting knob with four adjustment stop points would be provided to allow the beekeeper to ensure a minimum opening requirement and to provide some small degree of ventilation, even on the coldest of days. Additionally, there is a need to always purge CO2 from the hive produced by the colony. A side benefit would be some fresh air replacement into the hive would occur. Self-adjusting temperature slash ventilation controller continued. This mechanism would use a modified version of the same type of technology used in most home thermostats a bimetallic coil which unwinds and winds based on the temperature range designed into the coil's metal strip properties. One end of the coil would be secured to a fixed point inside the controller. The other end would be attached to a rack and pinion gear mechanism, the latter having mechanical linkage to a center axle. In turn, the actual axle would have an attached rotary disc, which would rotate when the axle rotates. The disc would have specifically designed openings for intended airflow requirements. Attached to a fixed position, concentric to and slightly offset from the rotary disc would be another disc, incapable of rotating and having the same shape and dimensions of the rotary disc. So let's discuss how it is intended to function. Starting early in the morning, the coil would be wound in a tight configuration from lower temperatures at night, and the openings within the rotary and fixed disc would be skewed, creating a closed and sealed condition. As the daytime sun would start to raise the temperature, the coil would start to unwind, thereby rotating the axle and attached rotary disc. Now openings between the fixed and rotary disc would start to appear and get larger as the temperature would rise. This process would reverse itself at night or if daytime temperatures were cold. The controller's outside openings would be screened to prevent intrusion by insects or flooding.
from heavy rains. Certain parts, such as the disc, would be fabricated from low heat transfer material. As with other components, this device would support more than one requirement, in this case both temperature and ventilation, the latter to be discussed. Automated front entrance temperature control for nighttime and daytime cold conditions. On the right is a photograph of an actual chicken coop door closure system developed by a UK company. Many Brits raise chickens as pets and naturally want to protect them. This device was not designed to provide temperature control. The device is called Dusk to Dawn and has been in use in the UK for several years to eliminate nighttime entry into the coop by rats, weasels, and foxes. It has been under test in my lab for over 14 months. The battery pack for each AA industrial batteries, Duracell brand, provided over 1,420 cycles before requiring replacement. This device has only one function, to sense light changes at dusk and dawn to close or open the coop's entry and exit door. It does this through a light sensor and a door unwinding and winding mechanism. Yes, it works extremely well. The left side graphic depicts how a modified and enhanced version of this type of controller would work in Inselheim. The electronic controller would be protected in a hermetically sealed housing, having an easy access cover. The controller would provide time current to a step motor, which would allow precise start and stop points, speed control, plus reversing capability. It would do this using an attached mechanical drive assembly. The door would be fabricated using strong composite materials with high temperature insulation properties. Listed below are user controller adjustments and fail safe features. One, light trigger points, closure and opening. Two, temperature trigger points, lower and upper. Override would provide for a cold daytime condition. Three fail safe features. When the controller would sense a low battery charge condition, the door would return or stay in the open position until battery placement and reset of the controller by the beekeeper. When closing, should the door incur mechanical resistance, the electronic controller would sense a voltage peak and immediately reverse the step motor to return the door to the open position and stay there until reset by the beekeeper. Should either or both of the fail safe modes be experienced by the electronic controller, a red LED light would be activated to alert the beekeeper. A solid red light would indicate the need for a battery replacement. A flashing red light would indicate a door obstruction. Note, this mechanism supports multiple functions, temperature and nighttime pest front entrance intrusion control soon to be discussed. Automated door closure continuation. Notice the graphic on the left, position number one, the entrance is fully open. Then on the right upper graphic, position two, the entrance is fully closed. But there's a requirement for a position three, 
The entrance is fully closed with left and right manually adjustable ports. It's obvious two positions are required, open and closed. However, bees need to be able to leave the hive, even during cold daytime conditions, to remove hive debris in their feces. This is the reason for the third position. Note there are three passageways openings on each side of the entrance door. Each have a manually adjustable slide to allow the beekeeper to set how many openings would be needed. Removable insulated front entrance cover. Most hives have little or no front entry protection from UV energy waves with their corresponding unwanted heat byproduct, wind-driven rain, or snow buildup, which might clog the entrance. This feature provides such protection by having a thick, insulation-filled roof. The top outside contours are provided to promote rain and snow runoff. Additionally, the cover has an easy removal feature for quick access to the front entry assembly. Ventilation control. Let's discuss convection ventilation to be used in insulin hive. Convection would begin when the colony's metabolic heat would warm the air within the hive causing the air above the colony to rise, simultaneously creating a vacuum below the colony. This vacuum would cause outside cooler air to be pulled in through openings, primarily through the large number of inlets within the bottom of the base. The number of opened or closed inlets would be determined by manually adjusting the cover over the inlets provided through the use of an adjustable heat blanket residing in the bottom drawer assembly, soon to be discussed. Optimized ducting designs of internal chimney contours would be essential to ensure the ascent of warm airflow to allow it to exit through the roof port. Convection rate would also be controlled by the same self-adjusting rotary vent discussed in the temperature control slides. Two manually adjustable front entrance metal closure ribbons would also supplement or decrease the amount of cool air entering the hive. The base entrance would also have an additional manually adjustable center vent with open and closed positions. When assembled or configured as a hive, the supers and brood boxes, each having a manually adjustable vent, could, when in the open position, promote an upward vortex of refreshing air. With brood boxes, tops and bottom openings closed off as when stacked upon each other during transport, these vents could afford sufficient ventilation for the colony. Again, ventilation and temperature controls often work hand in hand. Entire hive ventilation. As stated, the colony's metabolism is the heat generator which drives the convection process for ventilation and provides the warmth for the bees during cold periods. As you may know, honeybees do not hibernate during cold periods. Therefore, they must produce enough heat to survive. During this process, the bees exhale both water vapor and CO2, which must be purged from the hive. If not, these gases may compromise the colony's health. The unwanted results from not properly ventilating the hive will be discussed later in this presentation. One of the purposes of the skids or feet would be to elevate the bottom of the hive to allow sufficient cooler air to enter into the bottom of the hive 
especially during hot conditions. However, having this much area for unwanted entrance of other insects, a screen protection is essential. Removable base drawer with adjustable ventilation air pass-through feature. In this top isometric view of the bottom drawer, it not only shows the top surface of the insect barrier screen, it also displays the thermal blanket film. For different temperature conditions, as stated, it would be essential for the beekeeper to be able to adjust the number of open or closed air inlets in the base's bottom. The thermal blanket film would be similar to the blankets used in human survival kits to retain the body heat. However, Inselhive's thermal blanket would be more robust and designed to be used over and over. To cover more inlets, the beekeeper would grab the pull tab attached to the blanket and draw it to the back of the drawer. To open more inlets, he or she would wind the thermal blanket film back onto its collection roll using the two winding knobs. Ventilation flow through perforated removable floor grid. One of the reasons for the hive's floor being perforated would be to allow sufficient upward ventilation. Dual adjustable portal entrance slash exit closure and opening. Currently, the need to block or change the size of the front entrance to the hive is usually done by blocking part or all of the opening. This is a time-consuming process and does not always provide for a specific opening size. This unique subassembly not only allows for an easier and quicker adjustment, it affords the beekeeper to determine the exact number of portals to be left open or closed. In the yellow circle in the middle lower part of the slide, is a spring latch graphic. This latch would be captivated in upper and bottom channels, which would span across the hive's front opening. This would allow the latch to slide left or right within these channels. In the upper portion of the latch would be a thumb grip. On the unattached upper edge of this thumb grip, would be a catch engagement tab. This tab would be dimensioned to precisely fit into catch positions residing along the bottom surface of the entrance top bar. Each catch position would be exactly placed to provide intended stop points for the latch's catch engagement tab. The bottom portion of the latch would have an index finger grip tab. Attached to the latch would be a thin spring steel ribbon, which always wants to coil into a tight spiral. One end of the coil would be restrained by a fixed axle residing in the center of the coil, allowing the coil to wrap around it. The coil would always want to wind into a tight spiral. The other unrestrained end of this coil would be attached to the latch. So let's see how this entrance portal closure slash opening process would take place. The beekeeper would place his or her index finger on the lower surface of the index finger grip tab. Then they would place their thumb on the upper surface of the thumb grip tab. Now, squeezing their thumb and index finger together, the catch engagement tab could be lowered out of the current catch recess 
position. The latch would no longer be restrained in one catch position and could be pulled left or right. When the latch would be at a catch position providing the desired number of portals to be left open or closed, the thumb slash finger squeeze pressure would be relaxed, allowing the catch engagement tab to reset into the new catch position. Yes, this process would only take seconds to perform. Adjustable front vent. In the center of the front entrance would be an adjustable ventilation slide with two settings. To ensure there would be some ventilation within the base should all portals be closed, this feature would be available. Adjustable super and brood box vents. In the left graphic, the top plate has been displayed in a transparent mode to provide visibility of the resilient times formed on the sides of the closure slide. The underlying plate would have uniquely shaped profiles removed to allow the slide to move up and down in the three designated positions, fully opened, half open, and closed. The spring nature of the tines allow them to cam in and out of these set positions. The right graphic shows the fully assembled feature attached to its housing. The front of each brood box and super would incorporate one such slide feature. These vents would incorporate internally filled baffles to restrict entry of wind-driven rain entrance of unwanted insects, and to dampen unwanted intense winds. One-way beescapes, to be discussed later, would be incorporated into this assembly. In the center of the assembly, transmission holes would be provided for an enclosed RFID tag to be discussed in future slides. The entire assembly would be sealed and secured to the corresponding housing with special tamper-proof rivets. Especially during cold periods, it is essential to remove from the hive excess and unwanted humidity produced by the colony. If it isn't, it will condense into water droplets, fall and wet out the interior surfaces of the hive. This process promotes a moist environment in a dark hive, perfect for the growth of unwanted microorganisms. Yes, some of these microorganisms can cause harmful infections to the colony. Here is how this process happens. Specifically, the colony produced warm water vapor rises into the colder area within the upper portion of the hive. Some of it with the lowest latent heat potential loses some of its latent heat and reaches its dew point, then condenses into water droplets, first stage condensation. Now the remaining water vapor with the highest latent energy finally arrives in the coldest area in the hive next to the bottom surface of the cold lid and reaches its dew point and likewise condenses into water droplets, second stage condensation. This process will repeat itself until it gets warmer, the colony leaves the hive, or the colony dies of infection. Condensation collection and containment when a ventilation chimney system is in use. As soon as water vapor exhaled by the bees would begin to rise, some of it with the lowest latent heat potential could start to condense on the interior sidewall surfaces of the convection chimney, similar to what you may see on a cold day forming on the interior surface of your car's window. And it could start to form water droplets. These water droplets would probably begin to run downward 
due to gravity, yet cling to the chimney's interior surface due to water cohesion. This design would guide and channel the water down and into a collection catch basin to be discussed. First stage, condensation, collection, and containment. The water vapor having the lowest latent heat potential would start to condense as it would enter the roof and then precipitate into the bottom reservoir. This first stage condensation would not have the energy to revert to a vapor, so it would collect in the bottom reservoir. When checking the hive, the beekeeper could remove the roof and bleed off this unwanted water or an optional exterior manual bleed off feature could be provided. For final stage condensation, a passive dehumidification system is provided. As previously stated, the dehumidification functions are provided for cold seasons. In the two right graphics, a top view and a back isometric view depict this assembly. The portion in gray is the actual heat exchanger made from high heat conducting aluminum having multiple fins on the portion facing outside the hive, allowing exposure to cold external temperatures. The surface area is designed to provide sufficient heat transfer to the outside of the hive, yet not enough to cause significant metabolic heat loss, thereby compromising the health of the colony. To the left in the top area of the slide is an insulated cover in red, which is to be inserted over the heat exchanger during warm or hot conditions. It is constrained to the roof component via a leash. Below it is a front isometric view of the portion of the assembly exposed to the internal area within the roof, showing the numerous ports to allow entry of high latent heat humidity to enter the device. The two graphics on the left side depict cross sections of the device. Now, <clears throat> note the enlarged graphic in yellow. It is provided to demonstrate the water flow and condensation path. A is the entry path for water vapor at its highest energy point within the roof, entering the passive dehumidifier. B shows the water vapor enters the colder horizontal transition zone and starts to lose its latent energy. C, this zone is the coldest as it is next to the heat exchanger. When the water vapor nears it, most of the latent heat is lost. The dew point is reached, resulting in full condensation water droplets. D, this vertical channel provides a drainage path to outside the hive. Because of the downward capillary pull of the water column from gravity, a negative pressure vacuum is created, which causes more water vapor in condensation to be pulled into the system. Ventilation, temperature, and humidity control in a typical current hive. Let's assume the picture below describes a typical commercial hive design in use today. Well, where are the vents needed to create convection ventilation, air circulating upward within the hive? When outside temperatures are warm to hot and the bees add their metabolic heat, then to the bees the colony may feel their brood could be compromised by the heat and also concerned about softening or melting of the combs. What do the bees do? They start fanning at the hive's entrance. Yes, this consumes a lot of energy, honey consumption. 
when temperatures drop at night or during cold seasons, what do the bees do? They consume a lot of honey to be able to generate enough heat to stay alive, then cluster together within the hive, leaving the hive entrance unguarded. Wooden lids absorb heat during hot months, which without insulation allows the heat to go directly into the hive. During cold months, the internal hive heat is lost through the lids. Add a metal cover and you have really accelerated or exacerbated these problems because of a heat sink effect. The previous slides have described the unwanted outcomes. Unwanted drafts may occur between hive components due to gaps. Adequate and timely removal of CO2 to be expelled from the hive may not happen. Integrated Pest Management No wooden components Removable perforated floor and base for inspection and cleaning Removable base bottom drawer for inspection and maintenance of sticky collection paper No unwanted gaps between warped edges of boards or open splits Moisture control to reduce microorganisms outbreaks. Base entrance pest and debris collection plus inspection capability. Adjustable manual closure of entry and exit openings with directional passage control. Supports chemical, mechanical and other pest management systems through a flexible design. Smooth, non-porous, water-resistant interior surfaces. Automated front entry closure for dark hours. Screened vent openings. Super and brood box passageways with porter-style gates to prevent flying insects intrusion. Physical barriers and chemical repellents against crawling insects. Steam cleaning and radiation sterilization safe. Let's see why wooden hive components may not be optimal for colony health. On the left side, you see a graphic depicting a magnified view of the vascular system of a typical plant. Yes, even trees. Note these xylem tubes conduct water with dissolved soil nutrients upward from the roots into the plant and eventually to the leaves. Using photosynthesis, the leaves manufacture molecules needed by the plant and distribute them in solution form, sap, down into the plant. The purpose for showing this diagram is to demonstrate that plants, wood slash lumber, are mostly comprised of the xylem and phloem water or solutions conducting tubes, plus the surrounding support tissues. The tubes inside diameters are measured in microns. Another item to note, these tubes are mostly comprised of cellulose which is extremely hydrophilic, meaning they really like to absorb water. After a tree is cut into pieces, the pieces are commonly called wood. You already know this. Further, you probably know wood has to be dried to a prescribed moisture level to be usable as lumber. Okay, here is what it means to make a beehive component from wood slash lumber. The exposed surfaces of the wood, when viewed under a microscope, are miniature open-ended test tubes. 
allow them to absorb some water, usually derived from the water vapor generated by the bees, and you have a great breeding environment for microorganisms. Yes, thousands and thousands of culture tubes. Traditional wooden hive fabrication approach versus using advanced materials and manufacturing methods. Current wood approach. There seems to be at least four significant reasons why wooden hive components are so prevalent today. One, during Langstroth's 1860 era, wood was the standard for fabricating most parts, including hive components. This practice has persisted to today, mostly because when starting a beekeeping business or a beekeeping supplier business, only a small capital investment combined with already commonly known skill sets are needed to start production. As beekeeping businesses grew, many of these same approaches continued to be used, but only scaled in size. Further, current advanced materials and fabrication methods may require significant investment in molds, dyes, and supporting equipment, requiring different skill sets. Two, many beekeepers or suppliers of hive components have extensive woodworking skills and may have invested in large semi-automated woodworking equipment. When profits are shrinking, it's difficult to consider investments in new and different capital equipment using different unfamiliar technologies and skills, even though this might be the only way to increase profits. Three, many beekeeping owners may feel an obligation to keep their staff busy in the off season by building wooden hive components. Add to this is that the beekeeping industry appears to be steep in family tradition with an unspoken intent to preserve and pass on past practices of running their businesses. Four, many beekeeping owners seem to be making operating assumptions based on part cost reductions instead of reducing their total cost of beekeeping. Reasons for making a transition to advanced materials and fabrication methods. One, as you may know, Langstroth's major design breakthrough, 1860s, was the removable honeycomb frame. This design is now the industry standard. Today, current materials and fabrication methods have made possible plastic comb frames. The plastic comb frames seem to be competitive when compared to wooden versions, especially when factoring in their durability and disease resistant properties. Unfortunately, Langstroth's requirements for other hive components listed in Appendix A may not have been fully addressed. Today, using new materials and manufacturing slash assembly processes, maybe his requirements could be attained. Two, in the business portion of this presentation, you may note several beekeepers could be requested on a paid contract basis to have their staff trained to assemble advanced hive component designs. This opportunity would allow the beekeeper to possibly absorb some of their in-house labor costs and keep their staff working in the off season. Three, it seems the industry as a whole is struggling with lower profits. Through an in-depth investigation of actual total cost, the beekeeper may find several cost elements, many times not so obvious, which might be reduced or even eliminated by using newer technology. A beekeeper may ask why he should consider this approach. Because the current approaches may not be providing needed profit levels. 
automated front entry night closure restricts hive entry of nighttime flying pests. These two honeybee pests are night flyers and have superior olfactory smelling capability and can smell hives some distance away. As they fly around and are fortunate enough to sense hive smells, they head for the hive's entrance. They can freely enter the hive as their entrance is not contested. This is because all the bees in the colony, including the guard bees, are clustered together for warmth. These pests use a common practice to infect a hive by laying their eggs into brood cells while continuing to ravage the honeycombs in their contents. Removable perforated grid base floor. On the left, you see the removable perforated floor grid installed. Notice the perforations. This allows hive debris to fall through onto the sticky paper to be described later and to allow for proper hive ventilation which we have already discussed. On the right side, uh, notice the removable floor grid is partially removed. Smoke can be introduced from the bottom side of the base, which will ascend into the hive and drive the bees upward. This should allow the removable perforated grid floor to be removed for inspection and cleanup with little interference from bees or to the bees. Sticky paper assembly. The sticky paper assembly resides in the base drawer assembly. It consists of a removable rack which supports the sticky paper. Notice around all edges of the rack are gaps to allow for proper ventilation. On the left, you'll notice the sticky paper is positioned exactly below the perforations of the removable perforated grid floor. No unwanted openings from warped or damaged edges or open splits in hive components. Soon after wooden hive components are put into service, a gradual deterioration usually begins and accelerates over time. One splits develop and usually propagate in length and width. Two nailed dovetail or dado style joints absorb and release water at different rates, causing the mating boards to become stressed which may result in warping. Three top and bottom edges over time get damaged, usually from the use of hive tools to pry components apart. Four inside surfaces are usually not coated to reduce the chance of the bees consuming potentially toxic paint. The uncoated soft wood may present open joint cracks grooves or open wood grains, ideal hiding places and egg laying crevices for pests. Improper stacking and securing of hive components. What is often seen are hive components skewed left or right, creating gaps for possible insect intrusion. Often concrete blocks or large stones are used to stabilize and keep the hive together during windy conditions. A recent practice has been to dip wooden hive components into a resin coating bath. Good idea? I don't think so. Why? Well, it is a coating and will probably have a thin wall thickness. Puncture it with a hive tool or fork on a lift and you have breached the integrity of the coating and then you are back to what you see. 
only the deterioration will be somewhat slower. Now consider how uneven the bottom or mating surfaces may be as a result of the drip drying process. I have interior surfaces texture. Note the smooth non-porous surfaces, yet stippled to allow bees to walk up and down vertical walls. The intent is to provide a cleaner hive that does not harbor infestations. Entrance and exit areas incorporating pest slash hive debris collection and inspection capability. Here you see the front entrance of the hive having both entrance in red and exit in blue perforated grid covers over their corresponding collection vessels. Below is a similar graphic, but it depicts the perforated entrance grid removed from its mating collection vessel. On the right, only part of the entrance assembly is shown to display the installed clear collection vessels. Note the rain runoff ports to ensure drainage of any rain collected around the perforated grid covers. Above is a different styled removable collection vessel, which would afford front and back collection areas. The two collection areas are created by the use of a removable clear plastic partition. The front collection area is dedicated to the entrance slash exit zones as discussed. Behind the partition, a second collection area is created for the pest fall through chute on the entrance side and hive debris chute on the exit side. Controlled Directional Passage to Reduce Unwanted Pest Entry The sliding ribbon closure opening function has already been described in a prior slide. This slide is intended to depict how entry into the hive would be restricted to the right side portals and the primary exits from the hive would be confined to the left side portals. As related to pest management issues, this design approach narrows bee guard duty functions to the right side portals and allows guard bees precisely to guard only passageways. The left side would not need to be guarded as one-way porter gates would prohibit entry. Further, the metal ribbon slides would allow easy adjustment for desired number of portals to be left open or closed. Entrance and exit assembly can support different pest management systems. This unique entry assembly could support chemical, mechanical, and other potential future pest management systems. Porter style gates would provide for entry only on the front right side and exit only on the front left side. First, note that this subassembly would be easily and quickly removed from the front of the hive with minimal hive intrusion. Second, Different styles having potentially different number of ports could be inserted or removed. One-way passage in blue for entrance and red for exit supported through the use of porter style gates offer many opportunities for colony management. Integrated pest management, focus Varroa mite. There might be as many as six different ways to conduct Varroa mite integrated pest management. Below, I have indicated a colored legend for current industry practice. 
dark green in use, light green in test, yellow suggested approach, and blue beyond the scope of this presentation. One, systemic pesticides. Currently, this approach is the most commonly used method. Basically, systemic chemicals are delivered by diffusion through external body parts of the honeybee, such as feet pads. Then the chemical is assimilated into the honeybee's body fluids. Later, when the parasite would uptake the mixture of the honeybee's body fluid mixed with the toxic chemical pesticide, it may die sometime later. This approach has high risk potential. Compare the RBGH, the bovine growth hormone, cow slash milk controversy, and the resulting public outcry against the possibilities of a similar type of consumer uproar over honey, which may be contaminated with these types of pesticides. Tracking the effectiveness of this approach is also a problem because a significant percentage of the dead parasites may be sloughed off outside the hive and not counted. Two, mechanical removal from surface of honeybee. This is a safer approach than number one, yet it is not 100% effective in removing all external parasites that may be located at multiple and random locations on the honeybee. Three, induce static charge into honeybee slash attached mite, followed by discharge when they are grounded, causing mite ejection. Four, external chemical repellent. Many insects manufacture and expel defensive chemicals as a means to protect themselves against predators such as other insects. Maybe researchers could identify and isolate such types of chemicals which could be repulsive to mites yet tolerant to honeybees and not interfere with functions of the honeybees pheromones. If this were possible, the chemicals could be synthesized in bulk and applied to the honeybee as they entered the hive. 5. Physical coatings acting as a mechanical barrier to prevent the attachment and or penetration of the backside of the honeybee's thorax. As all beekeepers know, common practice by many queen bee breeders is to mark the backside of their queen's thorax with a colored paint or coating. I have no idea of the chemical makeup of these compounds, their average coating thickness or hardness when dry. However, these paint markers may already be acting as penetration barriers to the varroa mite. I wonder if there are fewer varroa mites attached to queen's thoraxes that have had these applied markings when compared to unmarked queens. If this assumption is correct, a coating non-toxic to the honeybee having physical properties which would inhibit the penetration of the mites proboscis into the honeybee and having acceptable bonding strength with the honeybee could be developed and applied to the backside of the thorax of any type of honeybee, queen, drone, or worker. Designing an automated roller applicator for the front entrance of the insel hive to perform the coating would be feasible. Six, molecular biology. This is beyond the scope of this presentation. Systemic liquid sustained release miticide system. For chemical pest control of the varroa mite, <clears throat> 
This design offers a different delivery approach from current practices. The prior slide suggested when using current methods and practices, just the honeybee would absorb or assimilate the miticide. This system could work in the same manner, or it could administer the miticide directly into the varroa mite. Further, it would make available precise and consistent delivery amounts of the miticide with the system capable of being installed or removed with little intrusion to the bees. With the capability to replenish the miticide from outside the hive, it would be easy to record quantities of miticide provided. Depicted in the upper left graphic is a sustained release miticide assembly intended to be inserted into an entrance housing. It would consist of a housing in blue, having side flanges in red, for easy insertion into and removal from mating channels within its entrance housing. A removable miticide rigid plastic strip is depicted in white and press fit into the blue housing. In the center of the screen is a circle depicting a magnified sectional view of the white strip, showing vertical capillary tubes surrounded or cast in a cured resin. These tubes would really like to absorb water or water solutions. Connected horizontal sparging tubes would conduct a miticide solution from the supply manifold to these vertical tubes. The vertical tubes would wick the miticide to the top surface of the strip, resulting in a dome of miticide extending above the top surface of the strip. When a bee or parasite would contact these miticide domes, their contact areas would wet out with the miticide. This process, when repeated, would withdraw miticide from these corresponding capillary tubes. This would immediately trigger a pulling up force to replenish the consumed miticide solution and recreate the solution dome from available miticide. Now, return your attention back to the sustained release housing. You will note barbed tubing fittings extending out of the housing to allow the attachment of miticide supply tubing and manifold subsystem. Soon to be discussed, a supply tubing would connect the manifold to a filling syringe. In the lower left portion of the screen, you will see a type of entrance housing capable of receiving a sustained release assembly in either the top areas of the passageways, creating a miticide ceiling dispensing approach, or the bottom areas of the passageways, creating a miticide delivery floor dispensing, dispensing approach. Yes, top and bottom approaches could be used simultaneously. With the sustained release delivery subsystem located in the top channels, it would mostly administer the miticide directly into the parasite of an infected bee and not the bee. Plus, the dimensions of the entire passageway would be dimensioned to specifically ensure no miticide would get into the bee's compound eyes. Depicted in the bottom left graphic is a sustain release system used simultaneously with an existing mechanical VMEC system. As mentioned, with this metered delivery approach, constant unwanted leaking resulting in unwanted damage or drainage into the hive would be eliminated. Another feature of this design approach 
would be when the delivery of the liquid pesticide is not wanted, the easy removal of the front entrance would provide quick access to the sustained release delivery system housing. The sustained release strip could then be easily removed from its housing, flipped over, and reinserted into the housing. This would create within the passageway a floor or ceiling of only flat plastic surfaces, immediately stopping delivery of miticide and subsequent absorption by the bees. In the right graphic, you will see the sustained release assembly and miticide delivery system in a back isometric view. The installed sustained release miticide system housing in blue is inserted into its entrance passageway housing. Shown is the refilling syringe with its measurement gradations. In the lower left graphic is a syringe with its attached removable refilling silicone rubber cap. The latter having self-closing refilling port. Uh, not depicted is the capability and method for the syringe assembly to be mounted within a concealed compartment on the outside of the hive's base housing to be located at a spe specific height above the sustained release system to provide the intended head pressure for exact delivery of the miticide and to eliminate potential spills. Again, having the syringe located outside the base housing would allow for easy and quick replenishment of the miticide with no hive intrusion and allow for price a precise replenishment and recording of administered miticide. Porter style gates are depicted to demonstrate how the one-way passages would ensure the bees entering the hive would have to transition against the sustained release delivery system. Varroa mite mechanical removal using slow, gentle, intact extraction, thereby reducing the chance of leaving remnant mite body parts in the honeybee. This mechanical process of removing mites, such as the Varroa mite, from the top surfaces of a host, a honeybee, top thorax area is based on anatomical differences in height between the top surfaces of the bee's compound eyes and the top surface of its thorax. Also, the bee must be partially constrained within a one-way passageway. The bee's forward travel is the engine, which would drive the removal process. In the next slide, removal of such pests from other areas of the bee are discussed. Here are the components of this removal system. An overhead mounting bracket would always want to deflect downward from the top surface of the passageway at a prescribed angle and height from the bottom surface of the passageway. Part of this component would consist of two leaf springs, which would create the prescribed downward deflection force. As the bee would travel through the passageway, the forward motion of its body surfaces would rotate the bracket upward. An extractor would be mounted onto its rotating bracket. As the bee would travel through the passageways, the extractor's smooth bottom surface would rest on the top surface of the bee's thorax. The mite would then be physically brought into the V-shaped slot within the extractor and eventually would be surrounded by compound 
angled side edges. One angle would increase in the outward direction while the other would increase in height as <clears throat> would its projected further into the component. Why all the fancy geometry? To allow the mite to be gently yet quickly removed from the bee. To ensure a clean separation of mite from the bee without leaving mite body remnants, which might cause infection in the bee. Quickly, to trap the mite behind the opposing offset gates, thereby ensuring full containment. Finally, when the mite would come into abrupt contact with ejection buttress edge, it would be thrown into a downward sloping area, which would empty into a disposal chute. The disposal chute would empty the mite into the backside of the before mentioned collection vessel. <clears throat> Mite Removal Rotary Brush The enlarged left photograph is provided to illustrate the numerous hair follicles, more like art thorns, on the backside and other areas of a varroa mite. The mite's hair follicles form exterior open loops. The rotary brush would contain a large number of bristles. Each bristle would have an extensive number of minute catch pores or closed loops all over their outer surfaces. This mite removal device would use a catch and release mechanism similar to what is used on a Velcro fastener. The mite being attached to the honeybee would move forward with the honeybee. The spring-loaded rotary brush bristles would be rotated downward and forward via contact with the transitioning mite. With a large number of open loops snagging the large number of closed loops, a significant attachment bond would be created. Continued forward movement of the honeybee and the attached mite would wind the torsion springs to their designated maximum resistance level, exceeding the attachment strength between the mite and the honeybee. At this point, a rapid unwinding of the bristles would occur, simultaneously pulling the mite off the honeybee and flinging it back and down, where it would fall through the perforated floor in the entrance housing and eventually down into the inspection collection vessel. On the upper left, you'll notice one assembly of the individual mite removal mechanism. And it is mounted on the leaf spring. The leaf spring is indicated. Remember, this is what keeps it in the down position at a designated height. In the middle left, you see the individual mechanism with the rotary brush and the torsion springs. Again, the bristles noted in enlargement below have enormous amount of porosity or closed loops. The bristles may be replaced with a mat roller material. Now in the upper right you see a front view looking into the entrance of the hive. Below it is an expanded or enlarged view showing how the rotary brushes would be waiting for the bee to engage the bristles. Below it to the left is the entrance housing that this device would be mounted in. The, each of the 
openings would have numerous grid perforations to allow fall through of the pest or mite. Again, after following, following through the perforated grid, the mice would land on a pest slide and then fall into the backside of the entrance collection vessel mentioned before. Crawling insect repellent system. In case there is an issue with crawling insects, hydrophilic, there's that word again, absorbs water and water solutions. Rigid plastic sponges would be press fit into channels running all the way around each skid's feet. Filling ports would allow the beekeeper to charge or replenish the sponges with a water repellent solution using a squirt bottle. Note the repellent solution would not have any insecticide properties, only irritant properties, plus its diffusion distance would be less than two inches. This optional removable metal entrance guard is intended to restrict entry of crawling insects through the front entrance. High pressure steam cleaning versus radiation sterilization. Many beekeepers may perceive radiation sterilization as a frightening process because they may think they, their colonies, hives, honey, or beeswax may be exposed to harmful lingering radiation effects. Additionally, they may think this process is new and long-term effects are not known. All of the above are not true. There would be no such effects because this type of radiation, gamma ray short wave ionization, leaves no residual radiation after the process is complete. Radiation sterilization has been used in Europe, Asia, and in North America for many years. This process is the standard when sterilizing plastic medical devices that you may already unfortunately need it to use. High pressure steam cleaning. This process has been used in the beekeeping industry for some time. However, using this method to control pests is only partially effective and disguises future hidden cost. Why? The temperature and or pressure are not high enough to kill spores, especially when used on wooden hive components. It provides a superficial cleaning impression to the eye, but a false negative result in reality. It is not totally effective when cleaning deep, small crevices or blind xylem slash phloem tubes in wooden hive components to remove microscopic insect eggs. Cleaning is not sterilization. If the microbial load is not brought to zero, the chances of reoccurrence are high. It is a very messy process and results are not reliable or consistent because it relies on arbitrary operator technique, plus consumes significant labor. A 100% kill rate would not be achieved even when using plastic or other non-porous hive fabrication materials. Requires a long control drying process when used on wooden components to reduce subsequent microbial growth and to reduce the possibility of board warping or splitting. Radiation sterilization. It's been used for many years in other industries, but not much of any in the beekeeping industry. Here are its advantages. 100% kill rate, even on spores. No residual radiation. Safe to use with approved and qualified plastic hive components and assembly materials very economical with many 
third party contract sterilizers located in most major cities. Simple process with significantly less labor required. Only requires staff, staff to stack and shrink wrap components on a pallet and deliver them to the contract sterilizer. Process takes less than an hour, which allows the components to be returned the same day. Full quality assurance proof through process control strips, process certification documentation, plus liability insurance. Components can be immediately put back into use, no post-op time. So why did I go in to so much detail on this subject? Because radiation sterilization, when even used on an infrequent basis, every three to four years, would significantly reduce microbial and other pest loads to a manageable level, plus provide longer hive component life. When hive components are identified to be contaminated, using the soon to be described barcode tracking process, they could immediately be taken out of surface service and cycled through the proposed radiation sterilization process. This is real pest management. Again, I'm sure most beekeepers have seen and know how excess moisture within the hive can promote extensive and profuse breeding environments for prolific and virulent microorganisms. The damage to the hive and colony is usually quick, not visible at first, and rapidly becomes extensive. Because many of these organisms, fungus, mold, and bacteria, can produce spores, which are usually not removed from wooden hives when using normal cleaning methods, they contaminate everything in and around the hive. Also, such spores are capable of contaminating other hive components transported by wind, touch, or other physical contact. Many times, hive components or entire hives may need to be destroyed, usually by burning and burial, as shown in the left photograph. Insula hive components. Industry compatible long-lasting, integrated. Inside dimensions of brood boxes and supers would accommodate industry standard Langstroth style comb frames. Vertical corrugated sidewalls for high compression values to resist outward ballooning. Weather resistant designs would use unitized construction approaches, providing for rugged, long-lasting components. All metal parts would be corrosion resistant, and if used on outside hive surfaces, would be protected with low heat transfer coatings. Patching, painting, or board replacement would not be needed. Components would be fully integrated with each other. Metal protective guards would be provided to resist hive tool and forklift slash boom lift damage. Built-in shelter protection against snow and sun could eliminate need for surrounding protective structures. Life expectancy would be greater than 15 years. This slide demonstrates the inside dimensions of insole hive supers and brood boxes are compatible with industry standards. On the right, note how the insole hive component is robust, weather resistant, and is designed using unitized construction approaches. 
high compression load values to resist ballooning of outside and inside walls of brood boxes and supers during transport. Imagine the compression forces on the inner and outer sidewalls of brood boxes on the bottom of the stacked load. Now think if the design of the plastic brood boxes outer sidewalls were a flat style or even having a horizontal band, you would probably start to see over time an outward ballooning or bulging effect. Why? Because most plastics cold flow if not well restrained. The insulide brood box and super would have two key structural design factors vertical corrugated flutes and strut supports connecting outer and inner walls. No, I'm not promoting water coolers. This water cooler uses similar materials in manufacturing processes, which would be used to create some insole hive housing components. It has been sold for over 19 years, used by field staff, usually mounted on the back of their trucks, exposed to hot summer days in the sun and extreme cold in the winter, especially at night. This cooler was not designed for high compression loads, stacking. If you visit Home Depot, grab one and take a look. Maybe you are already using one when in the field. Here are key design issues which will put Insel Hive's performance in a class by itself. Yes, beyond water coolers. Twice the thermal insulation properties. Better UV resistant resin formulations, polypropylene and chopped fiberglass with unique UV inhibitors would allow outer housing components to last up to 15 years in full sun exposure. With the unique outer vertical flute designs and locking struts between inside and outside walls, combined with the above resin formulation, these housing components would be extremely robust. Better protection of wear points using metal plates and guards high compression values when stacked for transport, steam cleaning and radiation sterilization resistant, materials which would be non-toxic to bees. Insole hive components, durability and integrity. This could be this. Have you experienced your hive housing components condition degrade faster than you had hoped or planned for, shorter half-life. All of this occurring in just a few seasons may be resulting in time-consuming and labor-intensive repairs. Further, this continued deterioration may seem to accelerate over time, requiring extensive refurbishment or even premature disposal. Here are some symptoms. Easily damaged by hive tools and lifts forks. Susceptible to pest damage to hive's interior wooden surfaces. Rapidly deteriorates from sun exposure. More frequent rotation of hive components from field ready status to repair required status. Shorter life cycle creating greater replacement costs. During off season when stored, extensive deterioration may occur. High maintenance requiring routine and recurring scraping, patching, and painting. Above affecting availability of hives 
for contracted pollination demand. Shabby condition may adversely impact quality of harvested honey. Insel Hive's robust designs would address the above issues. Metal guards to resist hive tools and forklift damage. On the left, notice the separation plates are on top and bottom surfaces and three sides of most components. In this view, a standard hive tool is showing as it is rotated up or down, the metal surfaces protect the hive components. On the right, notice the metal rails running down the two sides of most housing components protect the plastic parts from fork and boom lift damage. In the upper left photograph, you see hives positioned in a cold mountainous environment. Insel hive would protect the colony against cold enclosure from snow buildup around entrances or intrusion by wind driven rain. The lower left photograph shows hives positioned in a semi desert environment. Insel hive would protect the colony against extreme heat during the day and low temperatures at night. Rotary latches and pallet tie downs would secure hives in place even from severe winds. Insel Hive has built in shelter protection against snow, cold temperatures, or extreme sun and heat. Surrounding support structures may not be needed. Relocation flexibility. Immediate relocation may not be necessary for abrupt, severe weather changes. Relocation schedules may be delayed for better road conditions. Seasonal relocation might not even be required. Benefits for bees Less need for hive intrusion by beekeeper. Self-contained sanitary drinking solutions and feeding slurries and cakes systems. Significantly reduced incidence of drowning during drinking and eating activities. Monitoring capability of seasonal nutriment requirements. One-way bee escapes at each super level. Downward sloping base bottom and landing zone, providing cleaner and drier hive requiring less bee maintenance energy. Reduced need for bee propolis production. More defendable hive. Colony protection during dark hours and during extremely cold periods. Reduced entrance fanning during hot weather periods. Lower colony heat generation requirements during cold weather. Less hive intrusion by beekeeper. Numerous ways are provided to check on hive activity. Removable entrance, pest and hive debris collection vessels, inbound and outbound. Removable front entrance for easy replacement of pesticide devices. Removable base grid floor for large hive debris removal removable base drawer to inspect for pest types and loads, inspection ports for drinking solutions and feeding slurry slash cakes consumption. Self-contained sanitary drinking solutions 
and feeding slurries and cakes systems. On the left, you'll notice one housing, which will accommodate both systems. On the right, in the upper portion, you'll see the feeding or slurries and cakes system. Below it is the drinking or solutions system. Such an elaborate system may seem over the top. However, it has been well documented that requirements for timely, appropriate supplemental items, water solutions of microelements, and energy plus sustaining components are beneficial to provide for a robust colony, especially during winter months. To provide a strong colony at the beginning of spring, Having these items delivered outside the hive presents several problems, robbing by other colonies or by other types of insects and possible infection from other insects such as flies. <clears throat> Hopefully this system addresses two other beekeeping concerns, uncontrolled spilling and drowning of bees. Drinking Solutions System The drinking part of the system would support, at one time, four separate bottles. Each bottle would have molded-in gradations to allow for nutriment consumption measurement in the field. Within each bottle, solutions could be the same type of solution, or each bottle could contain other types of solutions and naturally just clean water. When the bottle would be filled either at the beekeeper's facility or by an outside third party, a label having description of its contents plus a supporting barcode would be applied. Yes, bottles could be reused. Entry and exit of the bee into and out of the drinking system would be provided through the four openings within the ventilation chimney wall at designated height. A round cap having a grid pattern could be installed over the top surface of the lower chimney should a feeding system not be in use. Should the drinking system need to be removed for a short period of time and low level intrusion to the colony plus less interference to the beekeeper from bees, a grid cap similarly described could be used to cap off the opening. The floor of this drinking system would, would be perforated to allow for any spillage to run down into a catch basin. The catch basin would have a drain cock to empty any spillage. The catch basin would have baffles to prevent sloshing during movement. There would be four circular depressed solution wells within the floor, each residing directly below each bottle. To be shown would be a dispensing valve and cap assembly to control replenishment of solution into these wells and reduce overspilling and subsequent spillage. Within each well would be a flat floating plastic ring having inside dimensions and outside dimensions small enough to afford free travel up and down the well. It's small enough gaps to prevent bee drowning. Further, each ring would have perforations small enough to allow solution to rise to its upper surface, but no more. And due to the buoyancy properties of the ring, it would only allow beads of solution to be available to the bees. 
again to prevent drowning. This graphic is a clarification of the self-contained sanitary drinking solution system without bottles. Notice the red dispensing assembly. The perforated floor to allow drainage of spills into the catch basin. The blue floating perforated plastic rings to prevent drowning of the bees. The chimney with its entrance and exit to the solution system. This slide demonstrates the solution dispensing assembly. You see it in the top isometric view in the upper left hand corner. In the lower left hand corner you see it in the bottom isometric view. Looking at the right side of the graphic you see it installed to the bottle and notice the standoffs which protrude downward and the gaps allow for fluid to come into the circular trough. The chimney comes in segments and each segment's opening can be closed off to the bees using a round perforated grid plate. Self-contained feeding slurries and cakes system mounted on solution drinking system. The feeding system may or may not be used in conjunction with the drinking system. It resides on the top of the drinking system and would be easily positioned or removed with two opposing grip handles. Self-contained feeding slurries and cakes system. Here you see the feeding system in a standalone mode which may be used for filling slash loading or cleaning. Lifting handles on the left and right sides allow for easy removal and replacement. Replenishment of slurries or cakes would probably be done with the system in place in the hive. Let's discuss the components of the system by starting with the slurries slash cakes holding vessels to each. They are connected to each other as one part. However, each vessel could have different types of slurries or cakes. In the center is a round opening to accommodate the upper chimney component. One of the functions of the upper chimney component is to allow entry and exit of the bees into and out of this system. Notice the graduation marks on each of the holding vessels provided for consumption measurement. Each holding vessel can support a removable perforated raft shown in green. The perforated raft is used when just slurries are being dispensed and removed when just cakes are being provided. The rafts would float down in the holding vessels as the slurry level goes down. The blue rectangles would be removable. Uh, they are hinged ramps to allow the bees to reach and leave the perforated rafts as it goes up and down. The removable perforated covers constrain the bees within the system yet allow the significant amount of water vapor to leave the hive through the roof vent. Ventilation chimney also functioning as entrance and exit paths to and from drinking and feeding systems. The chimney would be provided in two segments, a lower chimney section and an upper chimney section. Having two parts would allow just the drinking system to be used without the feeding system. Bayonet 
quarter turn locks would be provided for easy installation and removal. There would be four entrance and exit ports for the drinking system. Additionally, there would be two entrance and exit ports for the feeding system. A locking cap would be provided to ensure the chimney is restrained in place. Gripping fins for easy installation and removal would be provided. On the left, you see yellow arrows. These are locations within the chimney where removable internal perforated grid discs could be installed. When installed, they would prevent or restrict upward movement of bees. Internal features not shown. The internal contours would support the ventilation convection designs previously discussed. Collection channels would exist to route any internal spills from entrance and exit ports within the two systems down into the spill collection and containment basin, thereby reducing the chance of any spills entering the rest of the hive. As previously stated, the internal surfaces would have the collection and routing fins to direct wall condensation into the same spill collection and containment basin. One-way B exits, porter style, at each super level. The porter gate has been around for a long time. This mechanism is just an adaptation which meets insole hive's requirements. The opposing spring metal strips, which create a porter style gate, open when a slight pressure would be applied against their internal end surfaces and immediately close without continued pressure. Similar pressure from the outside forces the strips together to close the gate. Downward sloping base bottom and landing zone provides cleaner and drier hive requiring less bee energy for maintenance. A downward sloping floor with perforations allows easier removal of hive debris. When supported with collection devices below its top surfaces, the beekeeper is provided insight into some of the hive's activity. One additional benefit is any intrusive wind-driven rain is directed down and out the hive through drains. Reduce need for propolis gathering, forming, and subsequent application efforts. At my university, CSUF, the botany department had a large observation hive on the second floor of the science building. This custom hive was built entirely of glass and clear acrylic sheet stock, with the exception of the comb frames. The latter were the standard commercial type, fabricated from pine wood. Here is what I noted. If the joints between any combination glass and or acrylic sheets were adequately sealed, I didn't see the usual amount of propolis, as I had seen in the interior of a wooden hive. Yes, there was the usual propolis buildup on and around the wooden comb frames. Why the difference? Bees appear to make a determination where to apply propolis using the following criteria. Gaps or joints which allow airflow slash drafts seem to be considered by the bees to be detrimental. Crevices, cracks, porosity, or open joints may be considered by the bees 
as possible hiding or breeding areas for pathogens in pests. My conclusion, the need for propolis gathering and application due to deficiencies with hive components causes the bees to consume a tremendous amount of honey to generate the needed energy for the task. Therefore, better hive designs, less honey consumed. More defendable hive. On the outbound passageways, left side of the entrance, the porter gates restrict inbound insects, both colony bees and other unwanted insects. Further, they reduce the required number of guard bees. As the name implies, insul hive is an insulated hive enclosure. Its key benefit, lower colony heat generation requirements during cold nights in cold weather periods. Reduced entrance fanning during hot weather periods. Both activities not only consume significant amounts of honey, they redirect worker bees' efforts away from other essential tasks. Both may contribute to a weaker colony at spring. Reduced field servicing efforts and relocation time. Less need to relocate hives during cold and hot months. Hives could be left at location longer. Reduced number of trips to service hives. Built-in feature for easier removal of comb frames from supers or brood boxes. Easy and fast adjustment of entrance super or brood box vents. Removable front entrance for pest management tasks. Ports for inspection of solution and slurry slash cake systems and for recording consumption levels. Containment of solution and or slurry spills allows fast and simple drainage and cleanup. Removable flush rotary latches to secure housing components to each other. Easy and quick installation of hold downs for securing hives to pallets. Better housing components, hand grips. Lifting mechanism eliminates need for protruding cleats, which affords tighter load packing densities. Perforated reusable transport containment screens for top and bottom openings of brood boxes. Metal pockets for hive tool insertion and easy separation of supers and brood boxes. Transport, loading, securing, and manifest generation. Okay, several of you may be giddy thinking, does this guy really understand how we do business? Transporting hives from one site to another? Yes, but as to the drinking and feeding component, plus the roof component, they would need to be shipped separately and might even be warehoused at strategic points. Now, looking at the graphic below, you see a means to secure brood boxes slash supers to each other to provide a secure load during shipment. This is accomplished by having a molded in metal protection and retention insert along the edges of the brood boxes slash supers. They are retained together using the retainer clip in blue, described below. To install it is a special tool, a stacking shipping tool. 
To do the insertion, the beekeeper would grasp the blue retainer clip in his left hand, insert the tool, and rotate it 90 degrees clockwise. Then, <clears throat> using the tool slash retainer clip, the re retainer clip would be pushed into the retention inserts. Then the tool would be rotated counterclockwise and the tool would then be removed from the retainer clip. The retainer clip would hold be held in place by friction. Soon to be discussed would be the capability to scan the barcode on each brood box. This may assist in generating shipping manifests described below. Now, if state B inspectors could be convinced to adopt and use this scanning process as they performed their field inspections and record the health of each colony, then upload the data to the beekeeper, only certified healthy colonies would be loaded for shipment. Then the above process would be conducted to generate a manifest indicating health of each loaded colony. This might facilitate inspections at state lines. Below you see brood boxes and or brood boxes with bases. They could be configured for higher density shipping using separators as shown. The key feature of this mechanism would be that only a pushing down and not a pulling upward force would be required to break the seal on the comb frame from the super for easier removal. This very controlled removal process of the comb frame, naturally with a comb, would reduce chances of damage from the hive tool to both the housing and the comb frame, especially the comb frame ears. Plus, <clears throat> unwanted upward or sideways movements of the super would be reduced. The entire area where the top bar ears would rest would be metal, not plastic. Further, imagine how much safer the system in process would be to the bees with removing comb frames. The upper left graphic shows the internal, normally sealed mechanism, a rack and pinion gear assembly. Looking at the upper right graphic, Note two frames closest to the right side of the brood box slash super have been removed from their position slots for demonstration purposes. The first position closest to the housing sidewall depicts the pusher in red in the set or down position. Its corresponding plunger in blue is in the up position. This is the setting when comb frames are fully installed within the housing. In the second comb position, the plunger is in full down position and the pusher is in full up position, which pops the comb frame upward. The bottom right graphic shows the blue comb frame in the up position after the plunger has been pushed downward. Yes, two plungers on the corresponding ends of the same comb frame would need to be pushed down at one time. To replace the comb frames to its set position, the beekeeper would just place it back in, the, in position and press downward. Easy and fast adjustments of entrance and super or brood box vents. The graphic on the left side shows the front vent slides. They have resilient tines having spring properties, 
which would have the capability to cam in and out of recesses positioned at specific set points. This allows for three set points, fully opened, half opened, and fully closed. On the right is the front entrance adjustment of openings. The ease of adjusting both entrance and exit passageways at the front entrance of the brood box is afforded by this unique design. It requires the beekeeper simply to grasp the latch with thumb and index finger, squeeze them together to release them from a specific catch point, and slide left or right and release the latch into the new catch position. Removable front entrance for pest management activities. On the right side, you see a front view of the entrance assembly. It can be easily installed by positioning the locating hex pins above corresponding recesses and then pushing downward, then tightening the quarter turn fasteners for fast and easy removal. Removal is just the opposite process. On the left, you see a back side isometric view. The purpose for showing this is to show how easy it would be to remove it with little or no disturbance or adverse impact on the bees, allowing fast change out of other assemblies such as pest control management devices. Inspection and measurement process for solution in slurry consumption. Ports, two on the front and two on the back side of the housing, would afford thorough inspection and consumption measurement once inspection port covers were removed. Barcodes previously applied during filling operations would facilitate recording consumption quantities via a barcode scanner to be discussed later. Solution would always have barcode labels. However, slurries may or may not. Measurement marks for both nutriment types would be indicated. Measurement procedure. The beekeeper would pick up the field barcode scanner, again to be discussed, and select using the attached stylus the icon for the appropriate recording program. At this time, the scanner would automatically record the corresponding GPS location. Then he or she would scan the barcode for the current solution slurry cake outer housing. The selected inspection port from the drinking feeding outer housing would be removed to ensure complete recording of all containers, a repeatable procedure on what inspection port to begin with and the rotational direction to be used would need to be practiced. Now, he or she would scan the barcode for the nutriment container whose volume measurement is being recorded, followed by entering via the stylus the actual current volume in the bottle or vessel using the provided graduation marks. This and above steps would be repeated until all intended recording would be done. Note, as this hive component at the time of configuration and or field placement would have already been scanned and related or pegged to a specific brood box slash colony, consumption measurements would also be related to the colony. When uploaded to the company system, the data would provide detailed nutriment consumption data by nutriment type, volume, season, duration, location, etc. 
Additionally, these consumption measurements would be used for nutriment costing purposes. Interior solution and slurry spills containment and if needed fast and simple drainage and cleanup. As explained, any spill from the solution system would run down into the containment catch basin. Any spill of the slurry liquid would overflow around the solution system and into the same catch basin. The two left graphics depict these events. The lower right graphic shows an outside accessible valve which would allow the beekeeper to check to see if there was any spill. If so, the spill could be drained using this valve. Should a spill volume exceed the volume of the catch basin, a passive drain mechanism would be provided. It is depicted in the upper right graphic. The mechanism would simply be an open-ended both ends device with a small flange on one end to act as a stop when inserting it into the housing. It would be filled with red dyed table salt and the salt would then be compressed into a hard cake. Note the lower left graphics two holes, one through the right and left sides respectfully. From the inside of the housing, one passive drain assembly would be pressed fit into each such through hole opening in the housing wall. Its flange would act as a stop. Should a spill happen and its volume exceed the catch basin volume, the salt would be dissolved and the spill would drain to the outside of the housing. The red dye would tell the beekeeper there was a major spill. Again, the above designs are to ensure no spillage gets into supers and especially brood boxes. Also note the shapes of the projections within the catch basin. They have several purposes, one of which is to function as baffles to reduce sloshing. Rotary latches to secure housing components to each other. If the beekeeper needs to secure hive housings to each other, especially during high wind conditions, these rotary latches are provided. To install the style on the left, the beekeeper would press the rotary latch into provided arc-shaped slots within the opposing metal separation plates previously described. Using a special spanner wrench, he or she would rock the spanner wrench backwards to lift the spring catch lock upward and then rotate the latch assembly in a counterclockwise mode until the latch would reach the end of the slot. Then the spanner wrench would be rocked forward to allow the spring catch to lock into the provided slot. Removal is just the reverse process. A different type of rotary latch is provided for securing a brood box to a queen excluder to a super. Easy and quick way to install hold downs for securing hives to pallets. On the left, you see the components used to secure the hive to a pallet. They would consist of a pallet cleat, which would grasp the bottom side of the slats. Its low profile would not interfere with the forks on the left. A nylon cord would be physically restrained to the cleat. A cinch assembly would be applied to the hold down strip at any point desired. Here are the simple steps to install it. 
One, hook the cinch assembly's grip tabs into selected recesses along the hold down strip. Two, grasping the nylon cord captivated to the pallet cleat, lower the cleat portion into the gap between opposing pallet slats. Make sure the top surface of the pallet cleat having the cleat teeth is under both surfaces of both opposing pallet slats. Three, twist the cord to ensure the pallet cleat would be at 90 degrees to the pallet slats and then pull the cord to bring the pallet cleat into the position you want. In the graphic, it is pulled against the inside surface of the pallet side runner. Four, now pulling the cord over the cinching loop as tight as you can, pull the cord downward and into the locking loop until it would be secured. Bingo, you are done, takes maybe 10 seconds. Removing it would be just as simple. Mobile lifting crane and workstation. On the right, you see a list of features in this lifting device. This mobile lifting system was presented to possibly assist the beekeeper when heavy hive components, such as the proposed drinking and feeding module, would need to be removed or set aside. Further, having close, convenient, and clean workspaces might be beneficial. The lifting unit's pallet attachment feature is designed to slide under an elevated hive base, such as described in the insel hive system. The photograph of a typical field utility vehicle is presented to suggest mating the lifting unit without the pallet attachment base could be a practical combination to increase the beekeeper's productivity. Let's say beekeepers might find this equipment too costly for their current way of doing business. Well, see the last slide in the presentation to see how they could have additional working capital to pur purchase such equipment. Lifting mechanism eliminates need for protruding side cleats on component housings to provide greater packing density for shipping. The insel hive housing components, brood boxes and supers, are designed to butt against each other for maximum shipping packout density. To accomplish this, horizontal side cleats could not be used. Rather, a flush design would be needed. It would consist of two indentations having dual functions as hand grips and engagement recesses for the lifting lugs in this lifting device. They would be provided on each side of each housing component. This mechanism would consist of an opposing lifting devices as described above. They are intended to slide onto opposing forks on forklifts or lifting booms and then to be secured at a designated spot on the respective for forks. The middle horizontal guards on each side of said housing components would serve two functions to guide or direct and protect a component when lifting devices are inserted or removed. As the forks would be inserted around the component, lifting lugs would be able to cam in towards the component sidewall or away from it, plus rotate left or right. These functions allow for easy insertion and removal of the lifting lugs, all without damaging the components. The fork portion parallel to the operator 
would act as a stop when it would come in contact with the component's front or back sidewalls. Now, as the operator lifts the forks upward, a spring-loaded plate would stop any movement, as described above, of the device during transport. Lowering the forks would allow free movement of the device for removal of the forks. Yes, final versions would be simplified and reduced in size. Data collection asset management. Capability for in-field activity recording and reporting to home office. Better theft protection, tracking and asset retrieval. May facilitate field scheduling tasks with ability for internet posting, affording timely retrieval of data. Comprehensive service level reporting to grower slash client. Maintenance and replacement requirements tracking of hive components. Pesticide monitoring. This slide is provided as background for a soon to be presented discussion on using barcodes with this live. These types of decals would be a heat transfer type, meaning the graphic would be melted into the substrate plastic. It could not be removed without destroying the substrate plastic but a new decal could be heat transferred over a previous decal. On the right side, you'll see the nomenclature for the fields within the barcode. Below the barcode are potential scanning applications, soon to be discussed. Data scanning, recording, and transmission using a barcode scanner. Finally, we get to discuss the device that has been mentioned so many times in this presentation, the Field Durable Programmable Barcode Scanner and Data Recorder. As described in previous slides, this device could provide data scanning, recording, and transmission of field events and assets conditions to a blog or a designated computer to be used later by the beekeeper to better control his or her business. Below you see a photo of the barcode scanner slash recorder in use. This type of device would be programmed by a software engineer to allow scanning, recording, and transmission of relevant beekeeping data as described. Ease of use would be accomplished by using a stylus depicted in the photograph in the lower left corner. To select cascading icons, followed by selecting subsequent programmed bullet points, or the ability to add text and numeric data at specific points within the app. Roma, robust model designs of the device configured for demanding field applications, such as the chemical and petroleum industries would be used. Such devices would be sealed for protection from outside elements and have a transparent film to keep them clean and protected. Further, an active RFID tag would be sealed within the device should the device be lost or stolen. The next time you may be at Rite Aid or CVS pharmacies, look at the inventory clerks using a similar device. However, their device is intended for in-store use only. Data from this device can and should be uploaded nightly through any wireless router available at many commercial locations such as motels.
better theft protection in stolen hive retrieval, plus asset tracking, passive RFID tag. In the center of the slide, note the yellow circle, and within it is an actual size passive RFID tag, which would be used for the application we're discussing. Its actual size is compared to a dime to the right of it. Now in the left photograph, you see the same tag enlarged 15 times. Notice the extensive antenna wrapping around its periphery. These types of RFID tags have no batteries because they use a passive antenna capable of receiving specific radio waves frequencies, hitting their antenna and then immediately broadcasting the radio wave back to the sending unit in this application. A handheld sender slash scanner. Such broadcasting and receiving radio scanners do not require line of sight to function as with barcode systems. These devices are able to read this oscillation broadcast response several feet away from the passive RFID tags. Shippers such as UPS use such systems to track passive RFID tags on numerous packages passing at significant speeds on conveyors, even when the packages are piled onto each other. The tags are usually embedded within the shipping label. It has already been proposed by individuals within the North American beekeeping industry that in the future, beekeepers should be required to have hive components passing through state inspection stations to be charged with such RFID tags. Stolen hives could then be detected. These scanning systems could not only identify the hive components with tags, but could automatically count them. A quick comparison of the manifest counts could then be compared to the RFID count. Count discrepancies in RFID tags identified as not belonging to this shipment's beekeeper could initiate further investigation and possible legal action. Also, it has been suggested that handheld scanners could be used by state bee inspectors to identify hive components listed on a stolen bulletin. These types of RFID tags are inexpensive in volume, approximately six and a half cents each, and if not physically damaged, will last the life of the hive component. Compare the passive RFID tag cost with the cost of insurance for theft protection for that hive component. In the insel hive system, these tags could be embedded under the heat transfer barcode label described during the barcode discussion within the plastic housing wall <clears throat> using a closure method allowing the passage of radio waves. Removal of either device would render the hive component not usable, plus making it obvious to an observer the hive component had been tampered with. At this time, active RFID tags, such as OnStar and GM automobiles, are not cost effective and have technical requirements far exceeding this application. Activity scheduling and tracking based on field data reporting. The screen snaps of reports shown at the right are just dummy representative exhibits. Similar reporting of beekeeping activities providing tracking and scheduling visibility are relatively inexpensive to have programmed. Benefits are home office would be made aware of actual field activities 
allowing for detailed analysis. Tracking data from prior periods may be helpful in scheduling future similar tasks. Field task costs could be better identified and easier to analyze. Comprehensive service level reporting to grower slash client. This capability might not be required now, but in the future it might become a standard deliverable that the grower may insist on having. Also, a tool like this may help in gaining additional pollination contract business. Without comprehensive data collection, how is it possible to generate and provide such reports? Airborne Pesticide Exposure Tracking Below is a graphic depicting the insertion of a test strip into the pesticide exposure assembly. The outer and inner housing in a pesticide test strip are also identified. In the upper right corner, illustrated, is an outer housing with a N and a blue arrow molded into its dome to indicate true north. Three holes on each octagonal side are provided to allow airborne pesticide to come in contact with the pest strip. The outer and inner housing shapes would be octagonal to allow the insertion of an octagonal test strip. When inserting the test strip into the assembly, the designated end for north direction on the test strip would need to be aligned with the end slash blue arrow on the dome surface of the outer housing. The test strip. One would be water resistant. Two, test for multiple pesticides. Three, have barcode designation. Four, eight sides to indicate north, northeast, east, southeast, south, southwest, west, and northwest. Pesticide exposure testing, device insertion into the hive. One, the barcode on the test strip and the barcode on the corresponding brew box would be scanned into a pesticide exposure app residing in the barcode scanner. Not only would this test strip be linked to a specific colony, its precise GPS location would be recorded. The bottom end of the inner housing would be designed to allow insertion into a stacking boss on the top surface of the hive roof. The boss would have an octagonal mating shape for proper directional positioning and to afford a secure attachment between the two parts. The beekeeper would attempt to align the north side of the device with true north. Note. Should a positive marker be indicated on one of the octagonal sides of the test strip, the result would be recorded into the barcode reader pesticide exposure app. The recorded data combined with the published wind direction and velocity for that time period would give the beekeeper significant data for any legal actions should he or she pursue it. Revitalization of the North American beekeeping industry. I've provided the following tags for discussion. Industry, North American beekeeping industry, beekeepers. Consortium, organization to conduct this revitalization. A possible consortium could be an existing 501c nonprofit organization such as the Honey Bee Health Coalition, enhanced to incorporate the following goals and objectives, or a new like corporation would need to be formed. BHB, Benefactors of Healthy Honey Bees Pollination, vital to the success of their business. 
crops, bee pollinated crops. HCC, honey bee colony collapse. SGM, steering group members, representatives from all participants within and out of the industry. As a beekeeper, you may have had HCC significantly reduce your company's profitability and even threaten its existence. You may even think some of my designs, if implemented, might reduce HCC. So how could the industry, even if many members are lacking the funds or capital to act, implement a revitalization using some of my suggestions? Here is how I think the industry could conduct a turnaround process. The core assumption of this plan is that the industry would not fund this plan. Instead, the VHBs who significantly profit from said beekeepers efforts would need to step up and fund it. Why? Because these companies existence depends on it. Remember my opening statement about Walmart's robotic pollination device? Maybe Walmart and other BHB should be working with the industry to solve HCC. Maybe they and other stakeholders have not because they were just not asked in a convincing way. <clears throat> just think how many other nonprofits were and are able to get large corporations to assist providing funds to address their objectives, such as conquering diseases, etc. I think conquering HCC is as important as conquering some diseases, but it will take concerted effort by the industry to engage BHBs, again funding. A consortium's first year objectives could be to contact BHBs as defined below with the intent to explain the consortium's objectives to significantly reduce the incidence of HCC by focusing on hive designs and supporting practices across the industry and to request a charter donation sufficient to fund the industry's projected field testing expenditures. The BHBs would consist of crop growers and crop growers cooperatives, buyers and distributors of crops, food processors using crops, grocery store chains buying and selling crops, and honey processors and distributors. Note again, there would be no such solicitation for funds from North American beekeepers. With the above funding, the consortium could proceed with creating a SGM to generate conceptual designs for three to five different hive configurations. Through 3D processes, generate a number of prototypes for each configuration and supporting operating procedures. During each of the field testing years, the consortium could report findings to all BHBs as defined above. All designs would be rated on how well they would reduce the instances of HCC. Based on successful findings and finalization of a successful design, the consortium's main objective would be to acquire recurring annual contributions from BHBs. Assuming recurring annual contributions are sufficient, the consortium would proceed with final design and to create pilot production units with all supporting procedures and supply channels defined. Start small scale production of hive components. Establish a leasing program for the above defined hive components. Leasing payments would be due after the end of the season in which the components were delivered. 
For several reasons, the leasing program would need to be phased in over time. The hive components would only be leased, but at cost to the consortium plus process and handling fees. After the second season of the leasing program is completed, a refurbishing program would be implemented. From this point forward, new and used hive components would be available as equals for leasing. Radiation sterilization would be used in all consortium refurbished hive components. Regional consortium stocking and return centers could be established. This plan, yes, a tall order, does not suggest or imply the displacement of any stakeholder currently doing business in the industry. Just the opposite. They would be needed to make the plan successful, especially the current supply chain. Thanks for your time and consideration. Should you have any questions, my email address is listed below. I will be sure to respond. Again, thanks, and I truly hope this presentation was food for thought, which might give you ideas on how you could possibly increase your company's profitability. On the next to last slide, take a look at some of the Langstrophe requirements for a hive. See how they match up with the designs I presented. Thanks again. At the top of the screen is a phrase I coined to recognize the contributions that Langstrophe made to beekeeping. Langstrophe was to beekeeping as Mendel was to genetics and Darwin to evolution. The items below were excerpts that I took out of Langstrophe's Hive and the Honeybee, the classic beekeeper's manual. I used the items noted as a mini specification when I designed Insel Hive. If you don't have enough time to review these items, just take the video slide and pull it back and you'll see it again. Drawing source code. Insole Hive designs were developed using the 3D engineering software SolidWorks. They and all supporting data, including this presentation, are proprietary to Michael E. Farrell. However, depicted computer generated graphics within this presentation are offered as open designs available at no cost for use by the general public to recreate same or derived graphics or 3D computer generated models. Trademark graphics are not considered as open designs. Single use licenses of Michael E. Farrell's feature design trees generated using the SolidWorks software with supporting part and assembly proprietary uh, properties are not offered as open source designs. Licenses for each individual design are available in IGIS or STEP AP214 software formats with permission to use the code per stated terms and conditions. A small fee would be charged for each license.